Hello everybody, thank you for the opportunity to come along today. I'm a bit nervous that Ruth said I'm the final speaker, so I haven't really got anything to big, shiny, powerful final presentation for you. I don't have any fancy videos or pictures. So bear with me on that one. As Ruth also mentioned, this is my second visit to Open Access Africa. Um, at last year's conference, I brought along a draft of DFID's Open Access policy, and I shamelessly gathered ideas and your perspectives on that policy. Um, it was, of course, born in a UK institution by people sitting behind desks, and we really didn't know. <coughs> excuse me. We really didn't know how it panned out in a country like Africa. Um, so the intention last year was to come along and get perspectives on that policy, see which elements worked, see which elements didn't in a context like this. Uh, continuing in that theme, I'm shamelessly again going to get you to answer this question uh, for me. So it's not a rhetorical question. I genuinely don't know the answer to this. Um, I don't really know what difference uh, a donor like Diffid can make uh, to open access uh, in the African context, in the global context, indeed in the, even in the UK context. So. I've only really thought about sustainability about two weeks ago when I spoke to Ruth about coming to talk, and I only really thought about it uh, last Thursday when I was writing the presentation. Um, but I want to gather your ideas. This is roughly what I'll speak about. I'll say a little bit about um, DFID as an organisation, and specifically our interest in research and uh, evidence, because we've, we've got quite a specific interest in research and evidence, and that frames the way in which we think about open access to a degree. Um, I'll then talk about DFID and open access so far to date, uh, and I'll focus a little bit on the open access policy that we published and the one that I discussed last year in draft. And then the bit where I want to sort of gather your ideas, probably from the panel session and later discussions, I'll talk a little bit about DFID and sustainability of open access in the future, i.e., what should DFID do next. <coughs> So a little bit about DFID. Um, our activities, like most international development donors, are framed by the Millennium Development Goals, and which comes to an end in 2015, and so there's a very active discussion about what comes next. Anyway, our current activities are framed by the Millennium Development Goals. We work directly in 27 countries across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Most, in most of those countries, we actually have a presence. We have an office uh, in South Africa, it's in Victoria. DFID is increasingly results focused. We talk very much less about how much money we're spending and more about the results that we're achieving. Um, but if you're interested, we spend well over £7 billion. Uh, I don't know what that is, actually, but £7 billion on uh, international development. And that is increasing. We'll be, in a couple of years' time, we'll be one of the handful of countries who spends 0.7% of our GDP on international development and aid. So it's increasingly results focused and increasingly, and I'm talking over the last few years really, we want to be increasingly evidence informed. All of the interventions, our spending of all of that money, we want it to be based, or at least informed by the best available research evidence. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we want to always use the best available, available evidence in our policies and our programs. Indeed, nowadays, if you want to spend any money at all on a development program, within DFID, you have to demonstrate through research evidence both the need and your choice of intervention. Why? You have to use to make an evidence-based, or an evidence-informed, should I say, decision about how you want to spend that money. So if we want to be, have our activities informed by the best available evidence, well, there's two ways we can do that. And one is to fund, our, to fund research ourselves, and we do a lot of that. We spend over £200 million on research annually, and that's rising. In fact, that figure in the final accounting was higher than that. Probably this year we're in the region of 250 million pounds uh, on research. That's just through the department that I sit in. So it's, um, we call it RED, it's called the Research and Evidence Division within DFID. But actually our country offices, those 20 or country offices in country, uh, and our policy departments also commission research. We don't quite have a handle on how much that account amounts to. So to inform ourselves, we commission our own research. And we also, of course, do that as a global public good. Uh, this is just a rough idea that we're not only interested in the big headline uh, sectors of human development and agriculture. You might imagine that 
indeed, we would have quite a large interest in that. But we do fund uh, research across the board, including in the social sciences and economics. This is just a rough breakdown of uh, where we throw our money research. Okay, so the Research and Evidence Division's mission is to identify and generate the best evidence, knowledge, technology and ideas to improve the effectiveness of development. And most of our research shapes out to one of three areas. Some of it is to do with inventing new technologies and innovation. Uh, technologies in the sense of, uh, sort of, in the narrow sense of new crops, uh, new drugs, new vaccines and so on. But also uh, innovation more broadly conceived about new election systems, maybe, the free and fair elections. Um, this, yeah, the second one is about working out uh, what works and what doesn't. So we do work on, we're not just inventing the technologies, but actually taking technologies, taking ideas, taking interventions, working out which ones are effective, which ones are not effective, and we, do, we don't shy away from demonstrating that things simply don't work. We don't mind running experiments and stuff that turns out not to work. We think that's good value for money. Or doing what we don't want to do. Uh, the third strand of research is about understanding the context in which development happens. So that's where a lot of the economic and the social science research is in. Okay, so we want to do that, all of that work, and we want this work to inform policies, programs, and practice of poverty reduction. And we want to do that both for ourselves, so we commission that research both for ourselves but also as a global public good so others can find out what they ought to be doing in development to be most effective. But we only spent 200 odd million quid, uh, pounds, sorry, on, on research. And if we really want to be properly evidence informed as an institution, uh, we need access to the total evidence base. And we often find ourselves on the wrong side of the access barrier too. When I first arrived in Dickhead a few years ago, we had appalling access to evidence. So my job title is an evidence broker. I'm supposed to try and access the best available literature to inform DFID's activities. But I had terrible access to research literature. As soon as you leave a university, we all know that generally speaking, we heard some of this yesterday, that the availability of journals in higher education institutions worldwide is actually all right. But if you're not backed up by a university, so even if you're in, a developed country like the UK, sitting in a government department in the UK, I had appalling access to research evidence. So actually, we also have a self-interest in open access, as much as thinking that's the best way to get the value for money from the research that we fund, we also want to access the entire evidence base so that our interventions are most effective. Okay, so that's a little bit of a background to DFID and why we think, well, why we're interested in open access and some of the research that we've found. Um, just to move on to what DFID has done in the realm of open access so far, two main things. We have some programs that we fund that have an interest in open access. Um, you'll probably be, uh, a lot of you will be familiar with the INASP, work by INASP and the PERI program which DFID co funds. Uh, we've heard some talk about the Journals Online uh, initiative and they do some training and various other activities. We heard this morning Alistair Scott um, from the UK mention the MK4D uh, program, some of which is, uh, looks at open access issues and open access advocacy, and so the program which Alistair and Eve introduced earlier on today, um, the e-discussions, is, is something which DFID is co-funding. Um, so we do these, we have some small elements of some programs which are interested in open access. Okay, I'll come back to that later. But probably the thing which I'll mention now is that we have developed uh, an open and in what we're calling DFID Research Open and Enhanced Access Policy. Now, uh, we launched this in July this year to time with some other UK government activities around open access. Um, it became operational uh, this last Thursday, on the 1st of November, which I think it was last Thursday, it became operational. And I'll talk a bit more about its content um, in a moment. We had a pretty good um, press response to the launch of that journal. Uh, I should probably correct though, some, some blogs, some Twitter feeds, but it's slightly wrong. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean you 
that all of its back catalogue of research has suddenly become freely and openly available. That's just logistically, we, we can't do that. I'm afraid it's everything from the 1st of November that we, everything we fund new from the 1st of November forward will be openly accessible. I'm afraid not our back catalogue. It's a shame that some, some media outlets didn't quite get that subtlety. But anyway, so as mentioned, launched in July, effectively from the 1st of November. Um, the definition of open access that we use now will be pretty familiar. We've modified it a little bit. Um, there is a revocable free online access by any user worldwide. We're quite familiar with that. There's been a lot of talk uh, over the two days about intellectual property and use. And we shied away about making um, totally free use of um, material out of our definition of open access. That's only because I like Royal Trust, you even have their own solicitors, so we don't have that kind of. And I really couldn't get to grips with the entire IP landscape as we were developing this policy. So whilst we make recommendations around Creative Commons licenses, around um, CCBY being the ultimate ideal, we, we didn't mandate that, we don't insist on that because we don't really, in-house, we don't really understand the legal context for open access. And I, I, honestly, I still don't. So we kept that relatively simple uh, definition of open access, but we added this, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. We added this, what we, what, what we call enhanced access. I wish I'd come up with a better word for that, because I get asked, what do you mean by enhanced access all the time? Really, we, we thought about it quite simply. Everyone knows that being freely available, having material openly and freely accessible is only one half of the story. Um, what we wanted to is also just the other half, and that is help users uh, find, view, and download that material. So we heard yesterday there was some uh, stats. I think Jonathan gave some timings of how long took, how long it took some people in African countries to download individual articles. Well, our, our, in our policy, we talk about making and we point people towards resources to help them make articles and so on in different versions, which are easier to download. So there, there's a fancy all-color version. Uh, let me just see if it comes up. So here's the policy. Like, corporately, I had to produce a nice looking version of our policy, which looks like that, with a picture on it. And that picture is taken at Open Access Africa last year. Does anyone recognize themselves? I don't know if anyone knows. <laughs> 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 okay, I got permission from the people who took the photo to use it, but I didn't go back to the individuals within it. Um, great photo. Um, but unfortunately, if you want to download our policy, that's awful if you're sitting somewhere with limited connectivity, so we produce a text-only version as well, I should say. <coughs> so the objectives of our policy are threefold. Effect, just increase the number of research outputs that are open access, according to that definition, free, etc. Increase information to help you locate those research <coughs> outputs, more consistent um, use of metadata and that kind of stuff. And we also wanted to increase the accessibility of those outputs. So they're, they're, those are the three objectives. I'll just talk about some key features because I think a fair few of the concerns that have been raised over the last couple of days, we had anticipated, in part by coming, for example, to the conference last year, we had anticipated them and we had tried to include some kind of response to them. Already mentioned that we're not just interested in access but accessibility too. We're talking about open access and enhanced access to outputs, and we, we define outputs very broadly. So there's been a, a few people over the last few days have said we're a little bit of tunnel vision about uh, journal articles. Well, yeah, we talk about journal articles, but actually we're interested in everything that you produce if your research is funded by us. We name check journal articles, reports, which is a basket of work and papers, conference papers, other things. We name check books, data sets, um, all your multimedia stuff, website, software, but really, those are just the things that we name check and we talk about explicitly. But everything you produce, if you're funded, a research you're funded by DFID, needs to be open and accessible. Uh, some people said you're trying to do too much at once, and we thought, ah, we'll give it a go and see how we get on. Um, in part because, welcome to us, great, but tends to be focused on journal articles, research councils, and the UK government is obsessed with journal articles, we just wanted to broaden this out. So you don't think that's the end of the story. Um, if you are the mini features, if you're going to be funded by us, 
as a researcher, then before I'll give you any money at all, and in, if you enter an open competition for that money as well, you will have to complete what we're calling an access and data management plan. That is where you demonstrate that you've read our policy and you're going to try and maximise the open accessibility of all the outputs which you have. And if, it's, if the research is funded through open competition, we might judge you on that. It will become part of the criteria by which we we'll judge your application. Along with the likes of the World Trust and others, we, you can estimate and well, tell us how much your open access, open access activities will cost, and we will include that in the budget for the research. So we're happy for pay, to pay for that. And again, we're not talking just article processing fees. If you want to translate your stuff into pertinent local languages, that's fine. We, won't, we can try and look and pay for that. If you want training in how to set up an institutional repository at the time, we could look into that. So it's very, very broad ranging costs that we're happy to look into. Of course, there are criteria for this. It's got to be proportionate. It's got to represent value for money and all that kind of stuff. But we'll listen to you if you want funding over and above just after the processing fees. Uh, we have a preference for gold open access over green. If you go the green route, then you need to self-archive within six months. Uh, it's quite a, quite a strong policy, particularly in the UK, the UK context. And one of the other features I just pulled out is that you must deposit your data sets in an open access repository within 12 months of final data collection. I probably get more annoyed emails on that particular one than anything else. It's not an easy thing to achieve. That's very much, we admit that's very much aspirational. It's not easy to achieve that. But this is the route in which we want to go. And we will try and help our researchers achieve that. I think uh, Chris, I think, was speaking about, or oh, somebody today was speaking about flexibility in open access policies. And okay, so we're going to be flexible about this. And we will allow you to have an exemption, say, from this 12 month data requirement. But you would have to persuade us that it was better for development that you held onto your data sets longer than 12 months. It would have to be better for development. Not better for you, but better for development. And our policy just re uh, reaffirms the existence of DIFFA's own institutional repository, which is known as r 4 p So we launched this policy to quite warm, quite warm applause. Uh, but what do we do now? So this is really the crux of what I want to talk about today. Is what, do we, what do we do now as an organisation? Well, thinking about it last week, I reckon we've got four, roughly four choices. We could just be self-satisfied, okay, we've got this policy, great, we think it's quite a strong one, we think it's probably the most comprehensive amongst our peers that, we, that we're aware of. We could just service it. We could work on compliance, we know that compliance is always going to be an issue. Um, we could develop that policy, it's not perfect. You know, we could just look at, look at our own policy, do our own thing for our own researchers. We're probably always going to do that, but what else can DFID do? Well, there's a very lively domestic discussion in the UK and within the UK government about open access. Uh, for the UK government, um, open government is a very strong theme. All data coming out of government should be freely accessible. Uh, research data is a bit of an anomaly in government's thinking. But there's a very lively UK discussion around open access. We could get involved in that. And of course, this is mirrored at the international level, where we're very lively, as evidenced by this and the other conference going on in Silly Walsh this week. Very lively discussion internationally on open access. Maybe we could just get involved in that too. Or the fourth route is perhaps we should think about open access as a donor, we should think about open access more strategically. Take open access as an issue in, a, uh, an issue in and of itself. Perhaps develop a strategy, perhaps develop programs to support open access. Okay, so we'll, we'll almost take it on as a, as a development issue, much like vaccines are a development issue. Maybe open access is really important for poverty reduction. So maybe we should take it more seriously and take a more discreet approach to it. So perhaps this kind of approach is the obvious choice to maximise our support to open access and to open access sustainability. Think less about open access policies, think more about open access strategies and associated programs. 
So thinking about this last week, I thought, well, what does it mean to say when open access is sustainable? I don't have any, anything sophisticated to say about this at all. So I just, I just rustled up what I think will be a fairly standard definition of sustainability without really looking into it, so someone tell me if they've got a better one. Um, my guess is that it's sustainable when the ideal that we're all talking about in the last few days, when that ideal is met, okay, let's just assume that happens, but it's only sustainable if that new system endures and it doesn't slip back either to the present or a past situation that was more closed, or the system collapses entirely. We've heard quite a lot about how open access might threaten some forms of journals. Um, what we don't want is to reach a situation where we present, you know, push open access to the collapse of the whole publishing system or something like that. I don't know, I'm just thinking. So it would be sustainable if it looked like that. Now my question is, we've talked an awful lot about different facets of open access over the last two days. At what point can something like DFID, an organisation like DFID, at what point in the entire open access system should, well, could we and should we intervene to ensure the sustainability of open access? That's the question that I don't know the answer to. Now, for something like DFID, we have to be aware there are limiting conditions to what we can do. Certainly an important one is that for, for an organisation like DFID, open access is not an end in itself. Often it is spoken as that is the goal, is merely open access. For DFID that's not really enough. Um, if DFID is going to be continually interested in open access, it needs to have a, either de demonstrable or at least a plausible impact on poverty reduction. We're not allowed to spend any money if it's not somehow linked to poverty reduction. Legally speaking, we can't spend aid money if it's not somehow connected to poverty reduction. To demonstrate the impact of open access on poverty reduction, extremely difficult. But at least we might be able to invent a plausible theory of change which shows how you go from a, uh, open access through to poverty reduction. I haven't worked on that theory of change yet. If someone has done that, brilliant. I'd love to see it, but that's probably something which I'm going to have to do next. And then there are more normal resource constraints. Uh, budget, maybe I can find some money to put to open access, a few million dollars maybe over the course of three or four years, if I'm lucky, if I can make the case. And there's never going to be very many people within different organisationally who can dedicate to this. We're not like Welcome, who seem to have an army of people who are interested in open access. So I keep picking on Welcome Trust. And there's about uh, a quarter of me working on open access. It's not necessarily the head bit either. It's probably, <laughs> probably below the knee. I can work on that, uh, on this. So there are limitations. Now, So what can we do? Now, I was thinking about, so I said at what point in the open access system could DFID intervene? And I had no idea what the open access, what I meant by this open access system. And last week, I really couldn't draw it. I tried to draw what the system was. And then Eve presented yesterday the UNESCO uh, graphic of what the open access system looked like. And I thought, that's what I wanted. <laughs> but unfortunately, I didn't find it. Um, so I've got a very much cruder um, way of looking at the open access system. So I wondered to myself, what are the, po the possible points of engagement in this purported open access system? And I thought, in a typical way that you might think if you're in an organisation like DFID, I thought of three, uh, three levels at which DFID might engage, which interact. First of all, I'm not quite sure, open access of what, or the enhanced access of what. I'm not quite sure where DFID should throw its weight on that. Now here are just some things which we could be interested in. There's no way it would be exhaustive. Um, we also think about what's the unit analysis. We've talked a lot about different units of analysis, which is a bit of a clunky phrase which I came up with. But sometimes we're talking about individuals and their interest in open access, sometimes we're talking about local institutions, for example, a university, sometimes we're talking about national institutions, for example, government, sometimes we're talking about international institutions, 
maybe less go for example, as mentioned yesterday. But also, what's, what's the geography of interest to us? I'm interested at the local level, again, here we are sitting in Cape Town. Um, I'm interested in the national level, South Africa, given you know, focused countries. Regional, Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, South Asia, or are we interested in the international level? So all of these different points in the system where we could intervene. So I wondered what happened if you played around with the combinations, because we can't work on the entire system, we need to work out which bits we should work out. So I just came up with some different scenarios. What if we were interested in, uh, we were interested in data primarily, because actually I think in different, we think that data is the, is sort of the Cinderella, <laughs> I think that's the Cinderella of open access. People think open access to data is really important, but it's just too difficult. So let's not get involved in that. But maybe, therefore, that's where difference should throw its weight. So if we're interested in data, and we're interested in that at the individual level, researchers and others making their data available, and we want that on an international scale, everyone everywhere is making their data available. Well, does that lend itself to some kind of cascade capacity building program? I don't really know. What if you're also interested in data, but actually we're looking at national institutions, universities, governments, uh, at regional level. Does that mean we should be working on with those governments to develop regional repositories, say? Uh, or policies? I don't know. But maybe we should just go with the crowd and get interested in publications. And maybe we should do that at a local institution level. Maybe we should give block grants to, to um, institutions so that they can access APCs, um, article processing charges from that block grant at a national level. So maybe we should just be interested in a few countries, local institutions, give them money so they can fund APCs for people in their institution. I don't know, it's just a, it's a possibility. Um, we'll worry about that one. What about a little bit more left field? Well, actually, if we, we've heard a few times that it's fine having something free and openly available, but if you can't download it because your IT system is very rubbish, Maybe that's where we should throw away. Maybe we should actually look at the IT infrastructure. Maybe that's what we should get interested in. And maybe it's the infrastructure for local institutions at, say, a national level. So maybe we could give seed funding to local institutions um, to develop or to use the private sector to develop their IT infrastructure. I don't know. Maybe that's what we should do. Um, just one final one, just because um, we're not really interested necessarily in these individual <coughs> things which you could make open access. We're just interested in knowledge, just generally. So maybe everything should be open access. How, if we're interested in everything being open access, where on earth do we start? Do we work with national institutions, so the governments of countries, to develop national level policies, where we don't have one ourselves <laughs> in our own government? It's difficult to lobby other governments to do something which you're not doing in your own country, but maybe that's what we should be doing. I really don't know. So every combination on that sort of rather low-tech table lends itself to a different type of activity. And here's, here's I just sat down and I just wrote some down. We could do any, none, or some of these things. Um, capacity building, we could be a convening power, wouldn't cost very much money, we could just just bring together powerful actors and get them talking. Alternatively, all we could do is just spend money. So many journals ask us just to fund them. <laughs> um, maybe we could do that. Maybe we should go into seed funding to stimulate markets. I don't know. Should we dabble in markets? Should we just work on raising awareness? How about debating and discussing, which we're doing now? Should we get involved in the policy and regulation environment? Is that what we should do? With who? Should we actually just get the research base for open access better. One of the ironies of, of course, earlier on I was saying that difficult to all policies and programs to be evidence-based. But when I was writing our open access policy, the evidence base for it was pretty weak. Um, but I plowed on anyway. Uh, so maybe we should work on actually improving the case for open access by performing research on the benefits of open access. But we do our research quite openly. If that research showed that open access was not a good way to go, then we'd have to be honest about that. <laughs> and as I've already mentioned, maybe we should work on the IT, ICT infrastructure, something that DFID used to be interested in, got out of a little bit. Okay. So finally then, so what would, what, yeah, what should we do? 
Do we even decide what we should do? I've got some other questions. So I'm in the spirit of Conrad's presentation earlier on about throwing some questions. I actually only have three. But um, still, I'm still just posing questions at you. I don't even know what criteria I should use to choose what David should do about open access. I don't even know how to choose those criteria, let alone what they are. Again, I'm greatly here what criteria I should use to even think about this problem. And also, as mentioned, if DIFID is going to be interested continually in open access, it needs to have some kind of demonstrable impact, um, and preferably on poverty. I don't even know how to assess that. I don't even know um, how I would go about assessing the likely or actual impact of open access. Uh, okay, so I can find plenty of journal articles that debate uh, the impact on citations. But again, citations, that's not an end in itself. <laughs> That's not a very strong argument that it increases citations. Okay, so other scientists um, are citing that work. That doesn't mean it has any demonstrable impact on the real world at all. Um, so like I say, uh, any idea is gratefully received, and that's me done. 